welcome to another edition of Timwe Presents. Now today we are going to look at souvenir. Let me quickly um, let me quickly remind our audience what souvenir is. So we're talking about a module for keep talking and nobody explodes, and this is a special module because it will ask questions about. Uh, the uh, about some of the other modules on your bomb after you've solved them. For example, if you solve a 3D maze, it might ask you what were your floor markings, what was your cardinal direction. As you can imagine, this module requires special support for every module that it wants to ask questions about. As a result, we need to se separately add this support for every module. And here on the website, the repository of manual pages, we have a handy little filter which we can use to filter out the ones that are not a candidate or already supported. And we get a list of modules that you know might be considered or are already planned. When was the last time you blew up? Correct answer is not yet. <laughs> All right. So um, I am tempted to start at the bottom. However, before I start implementing new modules, I'm going to uh, show you a quick summary of the code that already exists. So here we are in Visual Studio. This is the source file for the souvenir module. If you open this up in Visual Studio, you can scroll through it. And one of the things that you will notice is there is this long list here of strings for each of the modules that are supported. These values are the module type property. What does that mean? Well, if you have a module, in fact, no, I, I don't even need to run Unity for this. It is the same as what the website calls module ID. So if I turn this on here, module ID, it's these strings here, right? So if we wanted to add support for USA Maze, then this is the ID that we would use. All right, let's close Unity again. So the second thing that you will notice is this long list here, which is yet another list of all the supported modules. What this does is it maps from the string, so button sequences, for example, to a method, a function. Now, if I go here, you will notice there is actually a long list of functions here, process 3 maze, process 3D tunnels, it's always process plus the name of a module. Right, if I collapse this, let me collapse that, please. Right, you can see the rest here is process chess. In fact, let me just collapse all of them with one keystroke. There you go. So we have this long list of process methods, one for each module. Now, I want to highlight uh, some of the simpler ones. I'm going to start with the simpler ones, and then I'm going to walk you through some of the uh, harder things. So I'm going to start with uncolored squares, because I find that that one's actually a pretty simple one. Now, for those of you who don't know how uncolored squares works, let me very quickly uh, show you the uh, manual. So you have this pattern of colors, and you have to look up a color for the column and a color for the row. Although the module requires you to do this multiple times, Souvenir will only ask about the first time. So that's what we're going to look at. So here's the, module, the, the me method for that module. So the first line is always one that retrieves the actual um, uh, component object for the uh, module, so in the case of uncolored squared. So what comes in here is the KM bomb module component, which all modules, all modded modules have. Uh, but in addition to that, of course, they also have their own script, you know, their own, um, you know, where the programming for the module itself is. And in the case of uncolored squares, it's called uncolored squares module. So that's the, that's what this retrieves. And this has several fields. Now, to understand what this is, let's take a quick look at the source code for uncolored squares, which of course is in the colored squares uh, repo because they're all bundled in one mod. So let's take a look at the uh, uncolored squares um, module.cs. This is the file which this, this line here retrieves, all right? It retrieves an instance of this class, the uncolored squares module. Now, in uncolored squares, we have these two fields here, which I added specifically for souvenir, as you can see. They're called first stage color one, first stage color two. But on top of that, we have another one, um, uh, this one here, which tells you whether the module is solved. Now, it's not listed in here because it's, it's um, inherited from the base class. So you'll just have to trust me that it's there. But uh, that's basically it. So we have these three fields. 
And that's what these three lines do. They retrieve a reference to the field. Notice they don't get the value from the field at this point. They only get a reference to the field itself. All right. At this point here, then we will check that all of these are uh, actually actually there. So if any of these are null, then the, the field is missing. Now, why am I doing this? Because I expect the field to be there, right? So why would it ever be null? Well, I, I want to point out that when I made Souvenir and throughout the years when I, uh, um, when I extended it, I was, I was very, very careful to make it as resilient as possible to possible changes in other modules. So if anyone were to make a change to another module, what I want to happen with Souvenir is that it will just ignore the module and abandon the questions about the module and still allow you to solve the bomb. I do not want to run into a case where Souvenir will just stall the bomb and make it unsolvable just because a module changed, okay? So, so we are using this to make sure that all of these fields actually exist. And in some of the other cases that I will show you in a second, you will notice that there, there are many more checks that I do to ensure that everything is uh, fine. All right. So now what we do, we wait for one frame just to ensure that the bomb has started. This doesn't necessarily mean that the bomb is activated. It's not the light has turned on, but it's rather that all of the modules have now been initialized. All right, and then we have this while loop which simply waits for the module to be solved. So this uh, coroutine, this, because this is I enumerable, it's a coroutine, will just keep waiting until the module is solved. So you will notice that it uses this dot get thing on the field. What this means is that it will reach into this file, or rather the object that uh, is of this, this class, and it will ask that object, what is your a value for this field right now, all right? And every time that that is false, it will wait for a tenth of a second, and then it will keep asking, are you solved now? Are you solved now? Are you solved now? How about now? Are you solved yet? Are you solved? Oh, now you're solved. Okay, so then we continue. Now there are two more lines that we need to account for here. This one is obvious. It says add questions. So that one actually adds the questions. I will show you how the questions are defined in a second. But what is this one here? Well, actually, when we implement our, our own souvenir support in a second, uh, then I will show you what happens if you uh, omit it. So for now, ignore this. Right, so let's take a look at this add questions thing. You will notice there is this make question function. This is actually the meat of it. And there are basically uh, at least two important things, but possibly three that you need to pass in. So let's take a look at the tooltips here. So the first one obviously is the question, which in, the ca in this case is the uncolored squares first stage question. I'll show you where that is declared in a second. And the next one is the module key. Well, that's just the string with the underscore that I've showed you. It's the one from this very long list of module IDs. And then the third one is the possible correct answers. In the majority of cases, this is just one possible correct answer, as in this case. But because sometimes there are several possible correct answers, for example, imagine the question on murder, where it asks, um, you know, who was a suspect but not the murderer in murder. There are possible, there are several possible options that were listed on the module. So you pass them in as an array. And Souvenir will do the rest for you. It will pick just one to show as the quote-unquote correct answer and fill the rest with wrong answers. And then finally, this one here, uh, extra format arguments. In order to explain this, I will now go to this, this, this question definition. So let's press, F, let's press F12 here. This will take you to a separate file, question.cs, in which every one of these questions are defined. And they all have this, this sort of name, which in this case is uncolored squares first stage. And they have this, which is called a custom attribute. So what does this have? Again, we can press Control Shift Space to look at the parameters. The first one, obviously, is the question text. And you might notice that inside that question text, you have these curly brackets. Well, the, the one with the zero is always going to be replaced with the name of the module, which is this one here. Right now, why don't I just put the name of the module here? Why don't I just say uncolored squares here? Well, what if you have more than one uncolored squares on the, on the bomb? 
In that case, the zero doesn't just say uncolored squares. It will say, for example, the uncolored squares that you solved first and the uncolored squares that you solved second. So Souvenir takes care of that for you. Just need to make sure that you put the zero here in curly brackets and the name of the module separately. OK, um, what's the next number? Well, this is the number of answers. This number must always be 4 or 6. All of them have either a 4, like here, or a 6, like, uh, like this one. So what's the difference? Well, it's the number of possible correct or wrong answers that it shows. And um, the idea here is that if, you're, if, you, if your answers are short things, such as, for example, just digits or just, you know, single words like blue, green, whatever, then you can display six of them. But if you have something like, for example, here, annoyed sonic, ball hog, blue lamp, or some of these are relatively long words. So if you wanted to squeeze six of them into the souvenir module, they will look very much uh, squeezed to the point of potentially being unreadable, especially on Twitch plays. So for those, we display only four possible answers. Now, in the case of uncolored squares, where were we here? Uh, we, we can afford six uh, possible answers because they are short enough. They're just the names of the six colors in the module. OK, now what's up with this extra format arguments? Hmm, I wonder what this is. There is a first and a second. Oh, maybe this relates to the one in the curly bracket that I haven't explained yet. And indeed, it does. So it might ask what was the first color in reading order, and it might ask what was the second color in reading order. So there are two different variants of the question, you could say. And each of these names, first or second, is substituted in for the one. You can also have questions such as, um, um, such as this one here, where you have a one and a two. So you have more than one possible parameter. And you will notice that this array has basically several combinations. So it's either first and first, or second and first, or first and second, or second and second. This, uh, this extra variable with the group size, this tells you how many there are. All right? So you always need to specify this and have it match the number of curly brackets beyond the zero that you have. OK, I hope I've explained that well enough. So with that, let's now get back to this code and take another look at this. Well, now hopefully you understand what this is. This is the thing that actually gets substituted in for this uh, curly bracket one. And obviously, if you have more than one, as we did here with, um, uh, what is this? This is 10 button color code. So why don't we take a quick look at 10, 10 button color code? Uh, here you will notice the command that adds the question for 10 button color code. And you will notice that the, the uh, extra format arguments here has two. Uh, elements. All right. So with that out of the way, um, we could now go ahead and implement something reasonably simple. Now, I haven't uh, prepared for this. I haven't really looked at the list to see uh, what would be the most suitable to implement the switch. I suppose the switch might be a good one. So we can take a look at the switch. And uh, let's see what, what we have here. Souvenir could ask what the initial colors of the top and bottom LEDs were. That's right, because there are always two stages, and only the second stage is visible once you've solved the module. So you can ask what the first stage was, what the colors of the LEDs were. You cannot ask whether the switch was up or down, because that will always be the same as what it is at the end, because you always switch it once and then once again. But the initial colors of the LEDs, that's something that it could ask. So let's take a look. So first of all, big switch is the module ID. So let's add this to this list. So we have, I'm going to put it here. Now let me quickly check, because I know that I've had other, yeah, so for example, the moon, I called it just moon, so that the alphabetic ordering is maintained. Here, bulb is just bulb instead of the bulb. So I'm going to call this switch. All right. And then we have this long list here where switches become switch process switch. Uh, did I change? Did I put the the here? Let's check process bulb. No, I didn't. OK, so I'm going to create a new method here and call it process switch. So the first thing we want to do is get the component. Now, at this point, we need to know what the class 
what the name of the class is. So let's take a look at the source code. Uh, the source code is um, .cs. All right, it's not in here. The switch is probably in here then. There we go, switch.cs. That's probably the one. There we go. It's called simply switch. So we call that switch. Now, first, we want to find out if it has a field that allows you to, to determine that it's solved. Um, uh, that is an interesting point, Mr. Peanut. I hadn't actually uh, tested it. I suppose we can test this out later. So for now, let's implement just the first stage lights. And then afterwards, you know, if we find that it disappears, we can ask about that as well. So let's see, we have a top LED and a bottom LED, but these are mesh renderers. I, I was expecting some kind of integer. Oh, there we go, bottom color, top color. So we do have integers. And um, solved, bingo. This is the one that we need to uh, wait for. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I answered your question. So let's, um, let's start with this. So we want the field for the solved. So we uh, get the field, and it is of type Boolean. We specify the type here. This is another one of those things that Souvenir will um, verify while it is, uh, you know, so, so that if the type has changed or the type is like not what I expected, maybe I made a mistake or whatever, uh, then it will complain. Okay, here's also another parameter called is public. So if it is in fact public, such as, such as these here are, then you will need to specify that. This is yet another layer of, um, um, uh, you know, of, of uh, trying to uh, be safe. But this one is not public. Protected actually counts as not public. So um, let's do that. Right, and then we want the uh, top color and bottom color, these, these two, all right? So we want the FLD bottom color equals get field. Now this is an int. So we're going to put int here and get that. And then we do the same thing with top color. There we go. All right, so far so good. That's the, that's the field that declared. Now I want to make sure that all of these are not null. So, oops. If this is null or bottom color is null or top color is null, then you'll break. Now, you might be wondering, why don't I output an error message here, right? If one of these is null, I want to know that they're null. Well, the reason I don't do that here is because these methods already do that. Sorry for the ping. Intense stream delay on my end. Okay, no worries. Don't worry about it. Um, so, for example, let's take a look at get field. You don't really need to know this, but, you know, it says here, attempt to get uh, from a null object. Okay. And then inside the field here, there we go. It tells you that it doesn't contain a field and then just returns null. So the error message will be there. So we don't need to worry about that, at least not for getting the fields. We will need to worry about it for other things. Okay. Now, I need to find out where in the script top and bottom color are assigned. Let's take a look. It is, in fact, assigned during module init. So let's see where module init is called. It is called during start. Okay, so I only need to wait for one frame like that. And then I, I, I'm, I know that start will have run. And so I know that the module will have been initialized. Um, so let me take a look where else module in it is called. It is also called here in cases where you get a strike. I will have to take care of that um, because, you know, if you get a strike, then you might not remember what the original LEDs were. You might have gotten them wrong. You might have written them down wrong. So Souvenir should only ask about the last successful run. Okay. So I also noticed that even this is set back to fall. So if, if you do get a strike, you still have to do two stages, which is okay, which is good. Um, okay. So it, it doesn't... Uh, Right, okay, it doesn't seem to set any values to tell me that it has striked, so I guess we'll have to do something uh, more complicated with that, but I'll get to that later. Let's do the simple thing first. So, after it has initialized, we're going to get the top and the bottom color. So, far top color is equal to top color.get, and bottom color, bottom color 
equals that dot get. Now, each of these are going to have a certain range of possible values, all right? So if we look at where this is uh, decided, you will notice here it says random dot range one to seven, which means that it will have a value of one, two, three, four, five, or six. So we're expecting it to be, to be between one and six. So I want to make sure that they are. If top color is less than one or greater than six, greater than six, or bottom color is less than one or greater than six, then now this time I want to output an error message and I'm going to output an error message similar to this one. I usually just copy and paste them from somewhere else, abandoning the switch because uh, top color or bottom color has an unexpected value. And then I'll just say the two values here, expected one, two, six. All right, and the two values that we have are uh, top color, bottom color, and that's it. All right, and then I'll yield break. So at this point, it will no longer ask a question about that particular module. All right, now that we have the top and bottom color, we now need to wait for the module to get solved. So while FLD solve while not FLD solve dot get, you'll return new wait for seconds point one. After the module has been solved, we now need to do two things. The first one is the one that I promised to you. I will show you what happens if you omit it. So I'll omit it. The second one is ask the question. So let's add questions. There are, there's going to be two questions. So before I can do this, I have to add a, a value here to my enum. Let's take a look at what you have to say. First success seems to be what determines if, yes, exa that's exactly what I meant. So if you get a strike, then that is set to false, which means that you still have to pass both of the stages again. All right, let's go here. Now again, did I put the in front, like for bulb, for example? Uh, let me just quickly check that. I did not. Okay, so I'm just going to call it switch. Let's see, switch uh, initial colors. Col color, colors, color. Right, so we need a question. Uh, what was the top or bottom color at the start of the switch? Right, now we have an interesting case. Because if I put the switch here, right, then Remember how I said that if you have two of the same module, then this will get replaced with the something you solved first, right? And now if it puts the switch in for the something, you will now have two of this the at the start of the the switch, right? We don't want that. But we also don't want this, right? We, we do want the here. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, let's take a look at how I did it for the moon. And you will notice here, it doesn't say the moon, it actually just says moon, but it has this extra um, a property here, add the. So we're going to use that. Oops, I did not mean to go here. Um, uh, we were at uh, switch initial, there we go. So we're going to add the equals true, All right? Now, um, Number of an oh, one comma too many. There you go. Number of answers. Well, these colors have short names, so I'm gonna put six. And in fact, there are six possible colors, so they will always just all be listed. Um, the right. I need a list of the actual possible colors. So let's take a look. Uh, maybe there is a log message here. Let's see if this has any logging. Um, debug log. Okay, let's find. There you go. Top LED, top name. Okay. Not quite sure why it says zero for the bottom LED. That's interesting. Um, okay, so top name. Ah, okay. That's how it does it. Um, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to simply... Okay, so first of all, let's, let's take a copy of uh, the actual names that there are yellow, green, blue, and purple, right? Then we're going to put these in double quotes. And like this. And now we have a list of them, and we can put those here. All right. Uh, what else? Oh, yes. We also need the um, example format arguments because... Ooh, 
I thought I had that selected. Format arguments. Right, so we only have a 1 and not a 2, so we only need 1. But we have two possible options, either top or bottom. So the group size is equal to 1. There we go. Okay, so that's, that's this part done. Right? But I'm still going to copy this array because I'm also going to put it somewhere in here. Uh, process switch, because I just lost my place. All right. So here we are going to have a uh, list of color names, and we're going to make that an array. There we go. And now we can add questions. So first, let's make the first question, which is switch initial color, uh, switch, possible correct answers. All right, so the top switch is color names of top color. However, you may re recall that top color actually starts at 1, but arrays, you know, always start at 0. So I'm just going to subtract 1 here to compensate for that. Extra format arguments, well, that would be top, right? Because we're asking about the top LED. Preferred wrong answers, in this case, we don't need any. Usually, I put something there to, like, you know, mislead the user. So, for example, if you had multiple stages, I will give the correct answer for the other stages in here. But we don't need that right now because it's just going to show all six of the colors anyway, so it makes no difference. So we can just omit that. Right, and then we do the same with bottom. Right, and that would be the bottom color. There you go. Now, why is it complaining? Cannot convert to this. All right, let me take a look at this. Ah, okay, I need to add the, the, the module, the reference to the KM module. There you go. All right, that works. Okay, so now I'm going to open Unity and recompile Souvenir, and then we're going to try this out. All right, here we go. And now I'm going to run the game. So here we go. We have green on top and red on the bottom. So I'm going to open the log file so I don't have to actually solve the module. It switches up. Top LED is green. Bottom LED is zero. As I suspected, it just says zero for the bottom one. Uh, rule is five. Number needed is nine. Okay. Let's wait for a nine. In the timer, that is. And click. The souvenir is still not doing anything. Right? Now it will say switch is down, which is weird because it's actually up. Top LED is red, yes, bottom LED is still zero. The number needed is a two. Okay, souvenir did not show a question. Why is that? Okay, so now I'm going to show you what I meant when I said earlier that this one line is missing, because that is the reason. That is probably the reason. So, um, as we look through the log, we notice this here. Abandoning a switch because you forgot to increment the solve count. Now, what does that mean? Well, remember that um, I said that if you have more than one of the same module on the bottom, uh, it will say, like, you know, the switch that you solved first and the switch that you solved second. In order to know which one is the first and the second, it has to keep track of which order you solved them in. So that's what this is for. So here is what we need to do. Right after the module is solved, uh, we have this module solved, and we use ink save or for increment safely uh, with, with, with that. So we pass in the string that identifies the module, and we just increment this by one. So the string will be the same for separate modules, right? So it will count how many of the same module, same type of module, have been solved. All right, so now let's try that again. All right, blowing up means never having to say you're sorry. Okay, so the initial state is yellow and red. As we can see here, the number we need is 3, which is here. And then we need a 4. I'm not sure if the last digit needs to be a 4 or any digit, but there we go. What was the bottom color at the start? Well, the top was yellow. <laughs> I didn't write it down, and the log doesn't tell me what it was. Do any of you remember what it was? Um, 
added a failsafe to prevent the module from displaying the switch you solved zeros exactly in the past it used to say the switch that you solved zeros and, and that was like really bad okay so what was the bottom color i think it was green i'm just gonna press green and it's not it was red and mod bomb is solved now here in the log we can see that it actually generated both of these questions right the top color and the bottom color so the top color was yellow the bottom color as we just found out is actually was actually red and it decided to ask this question right now you might might also notice that some of these log messages use the standard square brackets right like uh, this one here uses the square brackets around souvenir number one whereas others use the angle brackets now this is my way to output more logging information that i don't that, that normal users wouldn't normally be interested in so it's not that i don't want them to see it it's just that you know normally you only want to see what questions were actually asked and what the correct answer should have been uh, and also some other questions some other messages such as for example there was no question for yahtzee because you rolled a yahtzee right things like that whereas the angle bracket things they will still show up in the filtered log so if you if you really need to look at them you can see them but you know i hide away, hide them away by default but if someone sends me the log file when there is a bug then i can see what happened i can see all of the questions that were generated and stuff like that all right so with that out of the way we have just implemented support for the switch but now we have a problem because it will always ask about the first color rather than the first color in the last successful attempt we actually want to ask about the last successful attempt because if you get a strike the module gets reset and it should only ask about the last uh, you know the, the the one run where you succeeded so i'm actually going to rephrase the question what was the hmm color the top or bottom color um at the start of the last successful uh run of is that is that good english run is that how you say it at, what was the top color at the at the start of the last successful run I'm, I'm gonna leave it like this if you guys have any suggestions on how to improve the wording please let me know in the chat but now how do we fix this because right now it will get the top and bottom color right at the start immediately after the uh, module is generated what we need to do is we need to check whether you get a strike right so let me just very quickly see what happens when you do get a strike all right so if i click this uh-huh yeah it switches up and then yeah, there we go Round, which, round. Oh, I see. Round. That's a very good point. I should probably call it round because in other questions I do call it round. Okay. So round is a good idea. Okay. So there is only one selectable on this module, which is the switch itself. And I'm going to guess that there is... There you go. Flipper selectable. There is a field that points straight at this selectable so let's let's actually uh, retrieve that so um i'm actually gonna call it the switch i mean i can call it whatever i want right just as long as this string here has the correct name because this is the name of the field all right so let's make sure it's not null okay Whew. So here we get the top and bottom color right at the start of the module, but we want to get the new top and bottom color every time that you get a strike. Right, let, let's see. If I change anything in Switch, is there anything I should change? I fixed the logging, I believe. Okay. Um, did you fix the fact that the logging has up and down flipped, not just the zero? Make, make sure that both of those are... Um, Apart from that, I, d I don't think there's anything you need to change now. In fact, I would even argue that people shouldn't specifically change their module for Souvenir. But if you want to, then of course you can. All right. Now that we have a reference to the switch, um, switch selectable then, uh, we're going to get that. Uh, if, if that is null, then we're going to break out. Again, if this, you know, if, if the switch thing is null for some reason, then this will already output an error message to the log, so I don't need to output an error message here. 
Okay, and now I'm going to show you how you can hook into the uh, functionality for another module. All right, so I'm going to react. So every time that a person clicks the switch, I'm going to check if you got a strike. And if you do, I'm going to retrieve the top and bottom colors a second time. All right, so I'm going to retrieve the, um, the previous function that the uh, the, the switch had for its on interact event and then I'm going to assign a new one which is come on hurry up thank you right we do want to read okay so first of all we want to read we want to call the old one right we want to interact with the switch and we want to return the value that it returns so that from the point of view of the game nothing really changed but we want to see how many strikes there were uh, so we get the strikes handler, like, like that. And then if after interacting with this, we now have a different number of strikes, then we got a strike while pressing this. So at this point, we need to re-retrieve the top and the bottom color. So we're just copying this and we remove this because we want to assign to the same variables here. Now we cannot do a yield break here because we're inside of the delegate. So we're actually going to have to move this check to after the uh, solve thing, right? So at this point, if either of them have the wrong value, then we abandon, which means that we can also remove it here. So it's actually quite nice to sort of remove that redundancy. Here we go. Okay. So this code obviously relies on this you know that that when you press the thing that it will immediately change the colors on the switch but i believe that it does do that so let, let me just quickly check if you do a hand, handle strike here then it will immediately call module in it so it will immediately have new colors right which is good in some other modules there may be a delay here they might give the strike first and then start a coroutine and then initialize some values later in those cases you might have to get more creative and you can look at some of the other um, existing souvenir support for for cases where that happens but for now let's keep it simple okay so now let's test this and and see if this now gives us the correct values for the uh, last successful run right so I'm gonna get an in intentional strike and then look at the souvenir question all right now this time I'm going to actually write it down we had magenta and green Right, and then I'm going to do the first switch. Ooh, the type switch does not contain non-pub. Nah, ha, ha, ha. All right, let's abandon the game. So what happened here is that flipper selectable, I actually mentioned this earlier, flipper selectable is in fact public. Now as a uh, means of you know, safety to make sure that I know what I'm doing, I have to specify that it is public, otherwise it will refuse to get it. All right, thank you, Souvenir, for catching my mistake. Okay, so what just happened in the game is that I found that uh, Souvenir still asks me about the uh, first uh, round of the switch. You will see here that the question expected orange as the right answer, but orange was the correct answer at the start, but not after the strike. So there is a bug. So I added these two log messages, one for the user pressed the switch and one for the user got a strike. Now. While, while we were, uh, you know, having those technical difficulties, I actually realized what the error is. Uh, the, the problem is that I am checking the number of strikes on the bomb, but the number of strikes on the bomb doesn't actually change in time mode. And I was actually in time mode, you may remember that. So uh, it, it, the number of strikes doesn't matter, which means that it doesn't change. So th that means that I need to find something else. Okay, so how do we get around this? So we cannot actually check the number of strikes. Uh, I hadn't considered that because time mode means that the number of strikes doesn't actually change. So we need to find some other way that uh, the uh, that the module might might tell. Oh, um, yeah, we can actually check. All right, this is what we'll do. We have this first success variable, and we know that this gets set, gets set to true if you're successful and it gets set back to false, if not. 
right? So if it is still false after pressing the switch, then you must have just gotten a strike. There is no other way. So this is what we'll actually do. So how about that? So let's get the first success equals get field bool. All right, let's take that. Is it public? No, it is not public. All right, make sure that it is not null. Okay, I have this habit of reformatting the document every time, but this uh, several thousand line document takes a while to reformat. I really need to get out of that habit. Okay, so now instead of checking the number of strikes, I'm going to check um, their success. Uh, so I'm going to get the value for that and then interact with the switch. Actually, I don't need to get the value before interacting with it. I only need it afterwards because now if that is false, and I misspelled that for success, right? This means the user got a strike. Uh, need to retrieve the, co the new colors. All right. Okay. This should work, famous last words. We have green on top and red on the bottom. All right, and um, let's see what the correct answer is. The correct answer is seven. Right. Need to press on a seven, which is now. Click, and it's it's still green and red, but that's okay because I'm gonna get a strike, and then hopefully it changes. Um. So number needed is three, so I'm gonna wait for 29 just in case it's the three anywhere. So there we go, so that's definitely a strike. And now we have orange magenta. This is the one that I want Souvenir to ask about. The number needed is one, click, and now it is five. Click, and I'm getting a question. What was the top color at the start of the last successful round? So, if it thinks it's green, then it's wrong. Orange is the right answer. Ding! So that worked. Okay, okay. so that's the switch done. Now, there are two other modules that I wanted to show you. So let's, uh, let's walk through how the souvenir support for chess works. So as before, we get the, you know, the object for the chess module. We find the... Uh, in a selected list contains both the coordinates, which means the, uh, the coordinates, the six coordinates displayed on the module, and the solution, right? So this is actually an array with the length seven, where the first six are the coordinates on the module and the seventh one is the solution, right? So I am checking here that the length should be seven because that's what I expect. And I make sure that all of them are in the right range because the way that the chess module actually encodes these coordinates is using this sort of base 10 kind of system. Um, right, but if all of those checks pass, then it will just ask his questions. Now you will notice here that I'm using enumerable.range to generate six uh, make questions in a, you know, in a sort of sequence, you could say. So for each value of i going from zero to five, we can make a question using the coordinate at index i. Um, yeah. I, s I think I should probably introduce you to the function ordinal because I use that a lot. So what the chess function does is it says what was the hmm coordinate. Now that hmm will be either first, second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth, right? So it, 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 it could be fourth, fifth, or sixth. Oops, All right? It could be any of these, right? So the way the function does that is, you know, it returns the actual words first, second, and third for one, two, and three, but after that it adds the correct prefix. So you can always use that function to generate, you know, the sort of English ordinal. And as you can see here, I, I use parentheses if you have negative numbers, but, you know, so far that has never, uh, that has never been uh, required, so that has never happened. Okay, so apart from chess, uh, I wanted to show, okay, I've already shown you uncolored squares, and I wanted to show you Kudo Sudoku, right? So we have this array, uh, this 16 element array that tells you which of the 
squares are already shown at the start. So that's why it's called shown, because is which ones are shown. And as you can see here, it's a Boolean array, so each of them is either shown or not. So uh, we check which ones are pre-filled, and we, which, where, where shown is true, and we, show, we find which ones are not pre-filled by uh, prefixing that with a not operator, right? So it's, it's either pre-filled or not pre-filled. I am going to update the manual because the souvenir manual needs to list all of the questions that it can ask. And I'm going to add the one for the switch, which goes here. The switch, uh, what were the initial colors uh, at the start of the last successful round? All right, so if we go here, uh, souvenir, that's right. Um, the switch, there you go. But probing is definitely a suitable one. Souvenir could ask what the missing frequencies in each wire were. Let's do that, shall we? Let's do that. Let's go here, find MNOP const string probing. That goes here. All right, MNOP probing process probing. Here we go. Uh, you're not asking for the second stage. Ah, I totally forgot about that. Thank you, Riverboy. That is a very good point. I should ask about the second stage as well. Process switch. I will do that straight away. So um, we're going to have a top color one, bottom color one, and a top color two, bottom color two. And now these, I'm going to start out as minus one so that I can tell if I get them wrong, right? And then here, if first success is false, it means you got a strike. But if it's true, then it means that you um, moved on to the second stage. So we can just set this. There we go. Now, if top color one or top color one or bottom color one or bottom color one or Ah, oh, shit. <laughs> In the selection, change this to that. Thank you. Right, abandoning the switch because top color, top color one, bottom color one, top color two, bottom color two has an unexpected value. Three, four. Top color one, bottom color one, top color two, bottom color two. Here we go. All right. Okay. Um, so it could be at the start or at the end, right? At the start or at the end. All right, there we go. Um, okay. So now we have four questions in total. So let's take a copy of this, remove this, remove that. So um, this is a start and then end. One, one, two, two. And reformat. Yay, there you go. All right, so I guess we do want to test that now. But I've already started the probing thing. So I'm actually going to write the probing code too now, and then I will just uh, test both of them in a second, especially since the game apparently makes the stream lag. So um, let's just do the probing first. Now, probing is interesting because um, let, uh, let's, let's actually just take a look. Um, we don't actually have the source code for probing. This is a perky module. But that shouldn't stop us because um, we can find the DLL, which is this one here, and open it in a decompiler such as this one here called DNSpy. As you can see, I looked at synonyms in the past. So here's probing. Come on, probing, there you go. Uh, we have a probing module here. And we can see at least some of the code. All right, 
let's take a look. We have some values here. M numbers, M target wire. Oh, no. Okay, I'm not quite sure which one of these contains the uh, wire frequencies. Ah, M wires, that must be the one. M wires, bingo, wire values. Okay, now this seems to be a little uh, convoluted, but don't worry about it. So we definitely want to retrieve... Okay, so first of all, let's uh, retrieve the... Uh, uh, what is it called? Probing module? Yes, it's called probing module. And then we want to get the wires, which is a field. Now, here's an interesting thing. This field is of type probing module dot wire values array. Okay, we do not have access to the wire values type, especially since it's going to be a private type. See, it's actually private inside of this. All right. So, um, however, it's an enum. I, did, I didn't even realize that. I thought it was going to be a class. So that's, that's okay. So what we can actually do is we can say object because in C Sharp, everything can be converted to object. So you can always use object, right? But in this case, um, it's... The, the field is not actually just, just one wire, wire values, it's a, an array of wire values. So we can actually use this class array, which all arrays are convertible to, right? So even if it's like an int array or a string array, you could, you could put array and it will work, right? And the name for this is mwires, okay? And then if conv equals null or if ld wires equals null, uh, you'll break. All right. Now, is this all we need? Because I know that the wire values may change if you get a strike somewhere else on the bomb. So here in the update thing, if the number of strikes changes, then with a probability of 20%, it will generate new wire values. So we do need to make sure that we get the right values at the time when the module was solved. Um, all right, let, let's check out what this does. So M wires becomes a new array of six values. Ah, that, that is very useful that it actually assigns a new array because then we can, change, we can check that the array itself changed rather than the values in the array. Okay, and then it just sets uh, possible wires. Um, interesting, the first, oh, I see, it sets the first four to a specific value and the remaining two to a random one and then shuffles them up. That way it guarantees that all four values occur. All right, so if this wire, okay, this just implements the rule, so that just tells you what the solution is going to be, target wire A and B. Okay, so now we know what to look out for. We have an array of four elements, of, of six elements. It's an array of six elements, right? Update display, presumably. Um, all right. Um, let's take another look at this because I think I just noticed something about this. You will notice that the values here are 0, 1, 2, 4, and 8. This is no coincidence, right? This is a so-called flags enum. So these numbers are uh, powers of two. You know, it's 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. And these can be used with bitwise operations such as OR uh, to have several values in one. So a wire can actually have, like, for example, A and C together. And I'm fairly certain that's what it does. So if we go back to um, uh, set, 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 select wire, no, um, what was it, get wires? Generate, generate wire values. Um, possible wires. Ah, bingo. Okay, so these are the possible wires, right? You can either have A, B, and C, or A, B, and D, or A, C, and D, or B, C, and D. And you will notice that this uses bitwise OR, right, to combine these wire values. So, we don't actually want to, uh, you know, so, so the values are not going to be one two, 1, 2, 4, or 8. It's going to be a combination of three of those, all right? Is it a problem that the display will still show the frequency of the solution wires? Um, that's a very good question, but it's uh, not a big deal because we can just blank out the display. But thanks for pointing it out. I probably would have missed that, but I would have noticed that in testing. But since you mentioned it, I'm just going to 
do that straight away. So we are going to need the uh, display, display, which is a uh, text mesh, right, with that name, and it is public, right? And then uh, after solve, fld display dot text dot um, oh, get dot text equals empty. Well, I need to get the this the thing first. Make sure that it's not null. Oops, if display equals null, yield break, and then display dot text equals that. All right, blank out the display so that the user cannot see the readout for the um, solution wires. All right, now let me see if the module actually lets you uh, reclip the wires uh, after solve. Also need the interactables to so interacting with the module. Bingo! So you know that it does let you interact with it. Okay. No, these are not the actual wires. The wires are. Oh, there we go. Selectables. That's the one. All right. Let's get that. So var fld selectables equals get fields km selectable array uh, conf and the name is selectables and it is public. So let's do that. Or I forgot to check that. Or fld selectables equals null. Thank you. There you go. Okay. Uh, prevent the user from interacting with the wires after solving. Um, so for each of the, all oh right, no, var selectables. So we need to get this first, and then if selectables equals null or selectables that length is not equal to six. Then I want to abandon this. Let's just get a, a message here abandoning uh, probing because uh, selectables is null or has unexpected length, expected six. And then I will output what it is. So module ID first. Right, and then um, if selectables equals null, then I'm going to say null. Else, I'm going to put a square bracket, and in there put the selectables. Uh, so for each select, oh, I see. Any of the selectables could also be null. Um, so uh, or selectables dot any s equals null. There you go. So if the selectable is null, then null else uh, selectable. Join string, comma, poof. All right. And now for each of these selectables, there we go. We can just do this. So we've blanked out the display. We've prevented the user from interacting with it. We still need to. Um, uh, increment the solve count, right? So probing, uh, yeah, that's that. And here we need to wait for it to get solved. Now, how do we do that? Okay, so the field that we want for probing is not here. It's uh, here. It's called be solved, right? Okay, be solved. This get field bool on that, and is it public? Uh, click that. It is private, so no. Right, or solved equals null. And then while not fld solved.get, you'll return new wait for seconds point one. Okay. And then, of course, once again, module solved. Inks. I almost forgot that. There we go, increment that. Oh, there is the ink save. All right, so here then we need to add the questions. Poof, okay, so do we have any probing questions already? No, we don't, so let's add them. M-N-O-P, here we go, probing frequencies. Souvenir question, 
um, what was the missing frequency in the hmm, wire in hmm, question mark probing um, all right now here's the thing in our community we have the um, we, we have this convention that we call these wires one two three four five six in reading order however the, neither the module nor the manual refer to them in that way. And in fact, I don't even know if they are sort, if they're ordered the same way in the code. Maybe they are. We'll find out. But what I want to do instead is I want to refer to them by their colors because the color is always uh, the same. So I will refer to the first one as the orange and white and the next one the yellow and black and then the green and the gray. Right? Okay, so I will do that. All right, so the correct answers are uh, 10 hertz, 22 hertz, 50 hertz, and 60 hertz, right? These are the only possible correct answers, except that we want... Right, so since there are only four possible wrong answers, right? I'm going to put a four even though it, it, they are short enough to, to fit six, but we only have four. So let's see, example format arguments. Right, what was the missing frequency in the uh, orange white wire, in the yellow black wire, in the green wire, in the gray wire, in the uh, yellow orange wire, and the orange blue wire? Okay, there you go. Group size one. Now let's go back here. Okay, wire names. These are the wire names. Okay, um, wires. So we've got the wire names. Now we need to figure out what the frequencies are in each wire, which we get by uh, frequencies, which we get by retrieving the wires array. So if we get this, and it's not null. Uh, if, if it is null, then let's just uh, yield break. There you go. Um, I expect the length of this to be equal to 6, right? So I need to abandon this when the, list, when the length is not 6. Because um, m wires is null or has unexpected length expected 6, right? And right, let's put that here. And then wire... Nope. Yes, wire frequency equals null. Oops, let's put that here, here, um, and then here we can actually say uh, s dot two string wire frequencies. Ah, I see. I cannot use dot select on just array, but I can cast all of the um, you know all of the contents of the array to object, right? And then if any of them are null. But actually, none of them will be null because it's an array of an enum type. So I can actually remove this. So I will just stringify all of those enum values. And, you know, because this is a debug log message, like for, you know, the developer, it's okay that these are just numbers because they, they won't actually have like 10, 10 hertz or something. It'll be one of these A, B, C, or D. But that's okay. All right. Now then. Um retrieve the missing wire frequencies, right? So because this array, remember we figured out that that array contains one of these values. So it'll be a bitwise OR of the three possible frequencies that can be in the wire. And these frequencies are one, two, four, and eight, rather than, you know, what, right? So we are going to, so first of all, let's call this wire frequencies raw, and then let's create a new array. Uh, so for each of these, yeah, let's uh, cast that to object, and then so for each of those enum values, so I'm just gonna call this a value. All right. Um, you know what? Actually, I wonder if I can just cast this to int, and I know that these values, you know, once you evaluate them, is gonna be 1 plus 2 plus 4, 1 plus 2 plus 8, etc. right? So 
uh, the possible values are going to be uh, 1 to 4, 1 to 8, um, uh, 1, 4, 8, and 2, 4, 8. Is that right? Yeah, that, that is right. Okay, so this would be 7, this would be 11, this would be 13, and this would be 14. These are the possible values. All right? So that means that if, if the value is 7, then we know that the missing frequency is the one represented by 8, which I'm going to assume is 60 hertz. Right? If the value is 11, then the missing value is 50 hertz. If it's uh, 13, then it's um, uh, 22 hertz. And if it's 14, then it's 10 hertz. And in any other case, we will have made a mistake. So I'm going to return null, turn that into an array, and then say if wirefrequencies.length is not... Um, actually, we've already checked the length of the earlier array. So all I need to do is check if any of these is null. Yeah, in fact, I want to know which one was null. So I'm going to output the log message here. So I'm going to do this. Uh, in fact, right, let me just do this. All right, so now we have this sort of inner function. Right, and now I can say if... Um, yeah, I'm just going to turn this into lots and lots of ifs. So if val is 7, then return this. There you go. Else, uh, well, actually, we don't need the else because it's all returns, right? So, um, debug dot log format, and then at the end return null, obviously. So, uh, we want to output a souvenir thingy abandoning probing because I think at this point I want the index because um, wire number. Right, module ID index, y number index has unexpected value um, val, and I expected 7, 11, 13, 14. Dot. Poof. Okay, so now we have that array of wire frequencies, and now we can finally add the actual questions. Uh, where we go, what, oops wire frequencies dot select so we have wire frequencies and index um and we're gonna make a question on probing probing frequencies module key possible correct answers so the correct answer is all right so these are the wire names i also need the freq oh the frequency name is of course wf yep that's right uh extra format arguments uh, so we only need the name of the wire. Yep, the name of the wire, of course. We have wire names up here, wire names, and the index is this one here, ix. So we put ix. Um, do we need any preferred wrong answers? No, because there's only four possible answers anyway. That should do it. Microcontroller. Right, uh, Souvenir could ask about the order in which the LEDs lit up. Um, yes. We could do that. Yeah, okay, let's let's take a look at the source for microcontroller and see how it works. Um, let's see, it's somewhere in here. Micro.cs, that's probably the one. There we go. Okay, so when you press a button on Interact, like, yeah, when you press the OK button, that's when it chooses a new LED. So let's see what happens when you do this we press okay exciting times is the module already solved aha so at least it has a sort of solved thing which we can hook in which we can you know just just wait for audiovisual feedback on button press um right we play a sound is the solution correct i told you lots of bookkeeping <laughs> wow 
Color map solution, raw position, translate, LED, or wow. That is a four way nested. You know, I had a three way nested one in Kudo Sudoku, but wow, this is. Right, are we done with the module? If the current LED in it, the LED, or right, okay. So, yes, then we're done. And it's at solve to one, that is very useful. So next LED, so current LED index, so LED order, ah, oh, this is really helpful. LED order tells us the order in which the LEDs were uh, lit up. So that's really good. Plain, Evgen, LED materials. Ah, okay, so this just sets the new LED, the one that's supposed to lit up, to white or whatever it is. And if you get it wrong, you get a strike, that's it. Then M I A there constant string microcontroller. All right, so we want the ID, which is this very uh, obvious. Um, M N micro. So this is where that goes, and then we have process microcontroller. All right, so let's go here. Private I enumerable object process microcontroller can bomb bomb module. There we go. And the name is just micro, apparently. And we want solved, which is a integer. It should really be a Boolean, but you know it's not a big deal that it's an integer. Um there you go, it's called solved. Right, and then while not FLD solved, uh, get yield return. Uh, uh, I, uh, wait for seconds. Point one, this is what I want. If comp equals null or FLD solved equals null, yield break. Um, the module solved thing, increment that, microcontroller, right, and then here ask questions. All right, so this is not a boolean, so we cannot use this exclamation point thing. We just ask it if it's zero. That's what we're going to do. Yes, thank you. OK, so once it is solved, we can literally just take the, uh, uh, whoops, that's the wrong one. I was looking at this. We can literally just take the LED, what was it called? It was called LED order. There you go. It's a list of int LED order or order rin which the LEDs activate. All right, let's get the order rin. Um, LED is order equals get field list of int that and it's public. No, it's not public. All right, so if that is null, we abandon that. Okay, var. LED is order equals order equals that. If LED is order dot uh, equals null, then um, abandon that. Abandoning microcontroller because LED order is null. All right, now I also expect LED order to be of the length uh, 6, 8, or 10, right? Depending on, well, let's see, let's see where this is used. Let's see, randomize LED order. Aha, 6, 8, or 10, all right, all right? So, or LEDs order dot count not equal to 6 and not equal to 8 and not equal to 10. Um, close parenthesis, right? A value with A is null or unexpected length. Expected 6, 8, or 10. Now, if it is null, we want to say null. Otherwise, we'll just stringify the number of elements. There you go. Okay, so far so good. So now we have the LEDs order. Now, at this point, I don't know what's actually in there. It's uh, okay, it goes from zero to pins. So if it's, if it's like 10 pins, then the pins will be numbered zero to nine. So I'm just going to guess right now that this is probably just off by one. So we just add one. Um, 
where were we? Microcontroller pin order. Let's generate that enum mem member and let's put it in the right place. So many. Oh, god damn it. I remember when this file was still tiny. Um, all right, microcontroller pin order. Here we go. Um, what was the 10th? Uh, uh, which pin lit up 10th in microcontroller? Microcontroller uh, 6, and the possible answers are the numbers 1, to 3, 4, eight, up to 10. So let's just do that. All right. Uh, let's do that. There you go. Boink. All right, example format arguments. All right, which pin lit up first, second, third? I think it's good enough. Uh, group size equals one. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah, that's all we need. All right, let's go back to here. So we want to add questions. Open parenthesis now. Um, um, bu -bum. Yeah, I think I think we can just go. No, we don't even need any more of a range. We can start with LEDs order, and then for each of these, we have an LED and the index of that LED. Index means you know how, like fifth, you know wh whichever it is. So we want to make a question with that question. The module key is microcontroller. Possible correct answers. Okay, pin number LED. Right, so we want LED, and I'm gonna guess that they are off by one, so it's plus one. And then the format arguments now we want ordinal of index plus one, right? So zero in the index is the first, right? And preferred wrong answer, we don't need that. So we make these questions, we select that, and I forgot to put in the module parameter here. Yep, there you go, and that should be all that we need. Uh, this needs to become a string. That's why it's complaining. Okay. I am really surprised that we need this few. Like, literally only the... So, th 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 that is fairly rare, to be honest. So, that, that was actually remarkably easy. So, we have a microcontroller, a probing, and a switch to test. Fun, fun! Click. Okay, let's do the probing first because that one has logging thanks to tweak tweaks. The red clip should be connected uh, to a wire. Can ah okay, so ten plus sixty, so top right and bottom middle. So that should be the right answer. Now let's take a look at microcontroller. Um, there is no logging for microcontroller, so we're going to have to solve that. So let me do the switch first. Um, for the switch, we had uh, purple, purple at the start. Abandoning probing because mwise is null or has unexpected length. Whoa! Okay, let me close the game. So. All right, let me tell you what happened here, because, the, yeah, this looks like a very long array, but it's not. Because what I didn't take into account uh, is that, uh, here, m y. So m y is, is a list of enum values, right? And these enum values can be combinations of these. So if a single enum value is a combination of a, b, and c, it'll render as a, comma, b, comma, c, right? So... I need to fix that by joining these with like a semicolon, for example. Okay, so let's try that again. Good thing that this problem happened first, so I can get that out of the way. And let's do the, uh, what was it called? The probing first. So the red clip should be connected to bottom middle and then bottom right. Bottom middle, bottom right. All right. Let's wait for that to solve itself. And it's solved. 
All right, abandoning probing because it's right. Okay, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six. It does have the length six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I'm gonna have to check that. But first, let's see. All right, so the uh, blocking of input did work. Now let's let's also test the um, the the switch. All right, so. Um, we have, we have, um, where is it? There it is. Orange, blue, orange, blue, and we need number five. There we go. And then we have red, orange, and we want number four. Okay, so let's check out the logging. Uh, top color orange, bottom color blue. That was correct. Top color blue, bottom color orange. That is not correct. The top color should have been red. So why is it blue? Okay, so we'll have to investigate that. All right, so two problems that we found. The first one was the... Uh, M wires thing. So let's see. Um, M wires is FLD wires, and we get that. And if it is null, oh, right. I just wrote the wrong condition. All right. So we'll have to test that again. Let's recompile. Click. Pass. What was the missing frequency in the orange white wire? That was 50. That is correct. And the yellow black was 60. That is correct. And the green wire that is also 60. This seems to be correct. Okay, so we can put probing to rest, right? Probing seems to be working. So I'm going to put probing out, and then I'm going to put microcontroller in. Even when the module is passed, it will, yep, it will still call that and decide on diff. Oh, wow. That was very, very subtle. Okay. That should work then. All right, so yellow orange is correct and blue orange is correct yes we've done it okay now for the microcontroller so we've discovered that the leds in microcontroller are listed uh, in a different kind of order so of course so let's take another look at the microcontroller source code and i i strongly suspect um that led order right i strongly suspect that this um a uh, position translate thing does that. Let's find out where that is. There you go. Which number in the data sheet is which index of the LED? That is exactly what we need. Especially on pin I, it even explains everything here. Prefer. Oh, okay. Right. The numbering the players use, i.e., in the manual, starts in one corner and then goes around in a circle. The internal numbering is. I could have read that straight away. The array that translates between these two systems. Oh, and if you're wondering why the lowest value is 1 and not 0, I messed up and was too lazy to change it manually. I just fix it after the if-else block. Um, that means we're just going to get the position translate uh, array from the module, and that will tell us the position in the array, but zero base. Sorry, the position in the manual, but zero base. 